Hi, everyone. So I am, uh, I'm really happy to be here today. I've gotten the opportunity over these past couple of days to catch a number of uh, great talks, and I have met a number of kind and challenging people here over these past couple of days. And so I would like to thank the conference for curating a really memorable event and for bringing us all together. So thank you. Okay, I am here today to talk about the future. This mushy, cloudy, uh, nebulous, fantastical place that we call the future. So what is it actually? What is the future? Is it a point in time that we just arrive at? Is it some far out place or a world that we dream up in our minds? And if the future is a place or point in time, what exactly happens when we arrive? Is this what happens? Is Tom Cruise waiting for you in some minority report type of world? Is he waving his hands in the air, trying to hunt you down for a crime that you haven't committed? Or is this what happens? Well, we live in a world of scarcity, where we'll have to revert back to lifestyles similar to our ancestors, and maybe we will even have to forage for food to survive. Or is this what happens? Do we finally come to live in a utopian society where uh, technology saves the day by making us smarter and faster and stronger and more efficient? You can put a chip in your brain and learn another language and we'll have radical life extension so that we can live another 100 or 200 years and then also, of course, we'll no longer, no longer have to uh, work because super intelligent machines will do everything for us. And we can just spend our time immersed in a virtual world full of all of the pleasures that we could ever possibly imagine with absolutely no pain, no uh, struggle, and no complications. The special thing about the future is that it is loaded. It's a place where we store all of our, our baggage, our anxieties, our frustrations, our hopes, our excitements and fears. And so it makes perfect sense that throughout time we have always been mesmerized by the future. We try to predict and we try to speculate what will tomorrow be like when it arrives? How will I live? What will I eat? Can I fall in love? with my operating system. And what we get from these predictions are our visions and images and stories that creep into our minds and that stay in our minds for a very long time. If we go back to the scenario of living in a world with scarcity, there are people who spend their entire lives actively preparing for a future like this. So let me introduce you to a man that I call Doomsday Jerry. So I first saw Jerry on a National Geographic show called Doomsday Preppers, and, and this is a show that profiles people who spend their lives actively preparing for a doomsday of some sort, so that when it comes, they will be able to outlast and outlive any scenario. So what they do is that they stockpile food, weapons, water, they go through survival drills with their families. So Doomsday Jerry is a prepper, and he believes that a huge catastrophe is on its way, although he's, he's just not exactly sure what that catastrophe will be, whether it is a, a natural disaster or a nuclear attack or, or some sort of civil unrest where marauding gangs of poor people attack the rich. So he doesn't know which one of these futures will come to pass, but he knows that something is coming. And so he has spent seven million dollars preparing for it, including booby-trapping his house and buying a lifetime supply of premium toilet paper. Now you can call Jerry either a survivalist or a visionary or just plain paranoid, but regardless of what you call him, the fact is that Doomsday Jerry is a prime example of what it means to be mesmerized by a vision of the future. 
whether that future is a doomsday or whether it is bringing to life some, some uh, science fictional theme or, or technology. And here you can insert Minority Report or hoverboards or whatever incessant, played out narrative that we're often exposed to. These uh, visions and dreams and images of the future, they're powerful and, and they can mesmerize us. Let me give you another example. Here's a video that I'd like you to see. With this miniature transmitter. All right. Come in, Chief Quimby. Yes. What time is it? 8.29. How's it going? I have an emergency situation. Relay the information to headquarters. Enterprise. I read you. This is Secret Agent Rock Slag. Okay, partner, let's make a little spectacle of ourselves. I'm on my way. We're on our way. I'm on my way. We're on our way. I'm on my way. So, uh, after all these years, it's finally real. Talking uh, to your watch. This is a smartwatch commercial, obviously, and, and this is what I call the quintessential self-fulfilling prophecy. So pop culture has told us over and over again that talking into your watch is something that we should want. It is futuristic, it is sexy, and so we have constantly tried to produce it and to reproduce it. As if using your watch as a telephone is some major milestone in human advancement or some great unfulfilled need that is just finally being met, which it is not. But visions are powerful and they creep in all the time and when they do that, when we have an incredibly strong narrative that is stuck in our minds that people are still mesmerized by, then we will want to make that specific thing come to life. The thing about visions of tomorrow is that if we believe that this is the thing that's going to happen in the future, then this is how we will behave in the, in the present. These are the decisions and the actions that we will make today in order to make that future come to life. And that is exactly why visions are powerful, because they creep in and we collect them, and then they inspire us and they give us something to work towards. And we collect them certainly from uh, Hollywood, but we also collect them from a handful of other sources, uh, governments, corporations, literature. But in the, in the same ways that, that our visions can inspire us, they can also start to severely limit us because if we hear the same narratives all the time and if we see the same visuals all the time, then that becomes our scope of possibility. That becomes our benchmark for what we believe is good and, and what's not. And ultimately what that means is that you're then left with a narrow set of choices and imaginations about what the future could or, or should be like. So how do we do something about this? How do we change the fact that we do have these limited dominant narratives that, that guide so many of our imaginations and that as a result guide so many of our decisions? Well, what we can do is that we can start to build a mindset, a collective mindset that is open and flexible to explore the alternatives because there are alternatives. There are many different kinds of futures and many alternative realities out there for us to explore and for us to create. And I'm standing here today because creating this kind of mindset to think about the future is what my everyday work is about. So I work across design and future studies. And what that means is that I help people and I help organizations to uh, think about alternatives and to think about and to handle uncertainty. Because all futures are uncertain. And when you do accept the fact that you are dealing with something so unknowable, like the future, how do you still find a way to work towards a desired path forward? And that's what I try to do. Some people who do this kind of work are called futurists. And I do self-identify as a futurist, but that word still strikes me as uh, an, an interesting one because there is some mystery and glamour around it, which is partly because the future is very often used as a setting for far-off fantasies, for clean and uncomplicated uh, stories about utopias or dystopias or stories about technology as the savior or destroyer. And there is 
some mystery and there's a lot of drama around this. Now this framing or this use of the future makes sense if we look back to these guys. These are the founders of Italian futurism, and futurism was an artistic and a social movement that started in Italy in the early 20th century. So uh, uh, these futurists, these very well-dressed men, with a poet named F.T. Marinetti at the helm, so he's the, the gentleman in the center, they founded futurism because they wanted a way to, uh, to throw away all aspects of the past, and instead they wanted to celebrate everything that represented man's technological triumph over nature. This included celebrating the beauty of the machine age, the beauty of, of speed, of technology, and everything that could represent this, from the car to the airplane to the industrial city. And to spread their ideas, they published a series of manifestos, the first of which was called the Futurist Manifesto. And here's where they outlined their basic principles about the glory of the machine age, as well as other ideas about contempt for women, ideas about celebrating violence and war. So by the way, uh, Marinetti also co-wrote the Fascist Manifesto, and he ended up having a huge influence on Mussolini and on uh, fascist politics. But even if we don't focus on that last bit, and instead we just focus on the fact that, that these, these futurists, they were artists, and they were writers, and they wanted to provoke then they did an incredible job doing that because these ideas and this stream of futurism uh, has remained a, a major component of modern Western culture, this, this focus on speed and on technology. It represents how we uh, uh, often, in the developed world, how we ground our ideas tied to progress and tied to the future. And of course, this isn't only attributed to Italian futurism, but it is one line that we can trace back to. And for me, having a, a respect for this history is important, especially because I think it really shows that how we tell our stories about the future will depend on who is doing it. It will depend on that person's uh, traditions, their language, uh, their uh, mythology, whether it's a cast of Italian futurists in the 1900s or our current go-to figureheads that tell us stories about what we will be doing in 10 or 20 years who are very often touting some new kind of technology as the key to the future. These ideas and these imaginings will be quite different from that of, say, how a Polynesian culture might imagine similar concepts from a Polynesian worldview and set of experiences, which is rooted in a rich mythology that has a sacred respect for nature and cooperation with nature as the driving force towards a future. These two different groups of people will have different goals, sometimes completely, completely different goals. They'll even have different concepts of time. So, for instance, instead of a, a linear or, or a forward-looking concept of time that Americans and, and Europeans have, Polynesians might look more towards cyclical or ancestral time, which means looking back on cultural and spiritual aspects of the past in order to work towards a sustainable future. This difference in how we imagine is a huge part of why the concept of alternatives is so important. And when I say alternatives, I mean a couple of things. The first is our ability and our want to expand the sources, the perspectives, that, that we look to for inspiration and for knowledge, to open our lenses to alternative people, places, cultures, processes, that, that we believe can, can show us new ways in which the world could be and that we believe should be a part of a conversation on how to create change. The second part of why alternatives are important is based on the fundamental concept of future studies, which says that there is no the future. There is no the future as this thing that sits out here on a timeline and then it just shows up one day. Instead, there are many possible futures, and each one has some likelihood of coming to life. And in knowing this, our job, our collective job, is to imagine those alternative futures for us to pick apart and inspect so that we can get a, a good understanding of the, the kinds of outcomes that we want and the kinds of outcomes that we don't want. But more importantly, what are the series of actions and events that would lead us to one alternative versus another? And our ability to think in alternatives, I believe, 
is really centered on looking for new stories or different ways to tell stories. And of course, literature and film have always been key players in doing this. So recently I collaborated with the Danish Film Institute and the Danish film industry to explore the possible futures of fiction film coming out of Denmark, including new and different ways to develop uh, film, the, the development of the film market overall. And one of the areas that I looked into um, was the basic formulas that we use to tell our stories. So for instance, a lot of fiction in the West tends to follow a formula called the hero's journey. So the hero's journey is this structure for how to tell stories that goes like this. It says that when someone sets out on a journey in a story, that person has to undergo a lot of trials and challenges in order to return from their journey transformed, new and improved. Countless films follow this storyline from Star Wars to The Lion King, but this formula is just not the way they tell stories in other places. For example, in West Africa. So West African stories like uh, Nigerian stories are designed to preserve tradition. So what Nigerian stories do instead is that they uh, say that when someone sets out on a journey, that person should have already come from a tradition that is supposed to have made her ready for her journey. The, the real challenge is to set out on your journey to overcome obstacles and to resist change. And I'm gonna explain this to you in a minute, but just take this in. And Nigerian stories are taken in by a lot, a lot of people. So Nollywood is the Nigerian film industry, and this is an example of a Nollywood movie. And Nollywood is not only the second largest film industry in the world, but it is the, uh, based on volume, but it is the third most profitable, profitable based on overall revenue. And they have dominated the entire African market, which is 1.1 billion people who are taking in these Nigerian stories. And this way to inspect the formulas that we use, I think is, is especially important, not just for filmmakers or the film industry, but it's important to everyone in this room because when you take in new kinds of stories and when you really try to understand them in a deep way, however absurd they might seem to you at the start, but when you take in those stories and when you try to understand them in a deep way, it gives you an opportunity to reflect on your own stories that you tell and the formulas that you use to approach the world with. And I think that that is especially powerful these days, especially this preservation over change uh, duality because there is a lot of, of conflict in our world based on the fact that we don't really understand in, in any kind of a deep way other people's stories. And when we don't understand their stories, we don't understand what their dreams are based on, and then we can't understand what they're working towards. And so that's where conflict arises. And speaking about preservation over change in, in Sweden, which is, I know is a hot topic here, uh, in the United States with our current political climate and all over the world. Paying attention to how we tell our stories and to who tells those stories matter. And what better way do we have to tell stories about the future than through science fiction? Or at least what most uh, popular way do we have to tell these stories? From Frankenstein to the Space Odyssey to Wally, science fiction has always made us think about what things could be different. And we now more than ever have access to stories from all over the world, stories from Kenya, from the Philippines, from Mexico. And my absolute favorite, science fiction coming out of the Caribbean. So Caribbean science fiction is about aliens that rent the bodies of Cubans so that they can go on vacation on Earth. It is about Santeria mixed with time travel. It's about uh, Caribbean post-apocalyptic world shaped by climate change, and it's about so much more. But what happens when you take in these kinds of stories is that they might make you think new kinds of thoughts that may surprise you, like what future might a Caribbean culture build? What future societies, what future technologies? And what are the stories that Caribbeans tell themselves about what the future could be like based on their own history, traditions, mythology, language? I recently read a, a novel about Caribbeans that colonized another planet. 
And in this book, there was this surveillance robot overlord that watched over the entire planet. It was called Granny Nanny. And Granny Nanny didn't really behave like uh, your typical science fictional sinister tropes about surveillance. And so parts of the book started to get uh, a little too confusing to me. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to have to Google this name, Granny Nanny. So I Googled it, and I found out that Granny Nanny was some old woman who was a freedom fighter in Jamaica in the 1800s. And just by naming this piece of technology that, it took so many qualities of this elderly Jamaican woman. And that completely shaped uh, uh, the technology itself, but also the storyline of what living in a world with constant surveillance means. It opened up a new paradigm and a new way to negotiate really fundamental concepts about uh, freedom and about uh, what it means to be controlled in ways that were quite different from the, the mental models that I already had stored in my mind. Stories matter, and new or different kinds of stories than what you're used to will give you an opportunity to reevaluate your own mental models and your own assumptions, and that sits at the core of thinking in alternatives. It is exactly what they are meant to do, to have you think about alternative future worlds from a, a wide spectrum of, of civilizational viewpoints, of subcultures, of ways in which the world could change, of drivers for those changes, there are alternatives. And in the work that I do, design and futuring are two fields that come together in a, in a powerful way to explore the alternatives. So what design does is that it gives us a way to, to create and to draw out what the experiences of living in a certain future could be like in a way that's tangible so that you can see it, you can touch it, uh, possibly you can interact with it. And this means that you not only get an opportunity to critically think about a, a future possibility, but, but you can feel about it and you can respond from your gut. And that last component is really important because people first need to be able to imagine a future in a rich and full way, to see and to feel yourself in a different place before you can get a good enough idea on what it would be like so that you can try to figure out how to make it happen. Now, the futures part, one of the most um, impactful things that it does is that it gives you an opportunity to look at the world as one thing, as one big thing, one big interconnected interdependent system. Nothing in our world happens in isolation. Every uh, action and events uh, sets off a chain of other actions and events and, and consequences. And you have to be able to, to anticipate some of those consequences and to make sense of them. And that is a very important thing that futuring does. So when you bring these two fields together of design and futuring, it opens up a hybrid way of thinking and of doing things. And a really uh, useful and powerful tool in this work are scenarios. So scenarios are stories about the future. They are rich and detailed stories of a future that are so vivid and distinct and thought through, that you can start to see the good and the bad in them, the problems, the, the challenges, the opportunities that a certain future would present. Here's a project called the Citizen Rotation Office. It is by a speculative designer named Luke Sturgeon, who's someone that I often collaborate with. And the Citizen Rotation Office is a scenario. It is a 24-hour immersive experience of a future city where the housing market has been abolished, and instead, citizens are now made to rotate around the city, managed and monitored by a single government algorithm. An algorithm which is based on a citizen assessment that you have to undergo in order for it to extract information on your preferences and your behaviors, so that it can then create a rotation schedule for you. A rotation schedule for where you walk in the city, where you sleep, where you eat, the kinds of people you meet, and all the things that you don't see and that you don't do. This scenario used uh, digital props, improvisation actors, rented housing to immerse people in, in this future, to make them really feel like they were a part of it so that they could start to think about, how would I exist in this world and how would I contribute to it? And that is exactly what happened. People in this future started to create 
and to challenge concepts tied to it. And in doing so, they slowly began to unpack a host of other issues in this fictional future city about belonging and integration, about surveillance, about this filter bubble effect that we all live in, where we only really see things that fit in with our uh, preferences and our view of the world. And this is only magnified by our online lives. Scenario building in this kind of way can be used as, uh, for example, a way to experiment with how to build policies in an open, collaborative way to try to understand the layers of people's concerns and responses to change, or it can be used by, by businesses to develop services for the public space. And this kind of an immersive uh, method to scenario building, this is just one way to build scenarios. Scenarios have been developed for many decades as written narratives. They've been developed as design probes with worlds built around uh, 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 prototypes and objects. And they're used by all types of organizations to try to map out how things might grow and change and how they may be connected. But scenarios are just one tool out of many in thinking about the future. And I use them as a way to, to help clients gain insights in order to make decisions, whether it's design decisions or strategic decisions, because they do make you think deeply and creatively about the kinds of futures that could come to pass. And this is instrumental in helping to create a vision and a path forward and in building products, services, policies, processes around that vision. But one of the most impactful things that good scenario building does is that it will bring together people with very, very different perspectives. And you should want those different perspectives because they will represent sides of the story and experiences that you can't think of. But it also means that those different perspectives will surface conversations that are uncomfortable or confusing or taboo. And it should be doing that. You should be ready to have your uh, assum assumptions challenge. You should want to feel this kind of discomfort. And you should want to be confused, because that is what allows you to build a kind of flexibility to think in new ways, to, to solve problems in new ways, to see connections between things that you would have never thought would be connected. And if it's not doing that, if it's not making you feel these things, then it is very, very likely that the, the conversations that you're having about the future might not be very useful, and you may only be having them with people who think in the very same way that you do. Exploring possible futures isn't just so you can be challenged by thinking about them. It's so you can take this knowledge and these feelings, and you can find ways to act in the present. We think about the future so that we can act in the present, to find a way to make the present go in a new or a different direction. And this isn't one person's job. It can and it should be built into anyone's role to think about what things could be different in the near and distant future, and how could they be different. And a really useful tool to, to get you on your way to start thinking like this is with the four generic futures exercise developed by Jim Dater, which says that no matter what aspect of our futures is being discussed, when you really get down to it, there are only really four flavors of futures, four different boxes in which all of our stories about the future can be grouped into, and they are continue, collapse, discipline, and transformation. That goes for whether we're talking about the climate change or economic reform or the future of your ice cream shop. So let's take the future of your ice cream shop and let's plug it into these four scenarios to see what life could be like. What Continue says, this is the uh, business as usual scenario, it says that life will go on mostly in the future the same way as it did in the past. For your ice cream shop, this means that uh, business is good, you're experiencing continued growth, life is familiar, people still have money, they still like ice cream. Collapse says that the world, the way we know it, and the systems that exist within it just completely break down and we revert back to simpler lives. So how could your ice cream shop exist and thrive in a world where maybe due to climate change, a deep freeze takes over your country and it's never summer anymore? 
or maybe due to overconsumption, many of the things that we now enjoy are extinct, like cocoa beans. Now you can't make chocolate ice cream. People really like chocolate ice cream. Discipline says that we understand that there's an issue that we have to grapple with, um, so we will have to discipline ourselves, and we'll come together as a group, and we will do that, which might mean that we have to stop doing some things that we are very used to doing, but we'll, we'll do that while trying to hold on to some basic principles and some basic values that we really hold dear. This might mean for your ice cream shop that you want to take on, or maybe you have to take on, a zero food miles policy, which might mean that you keep one little cow in the backyard of your shop that you use to source your milk. When the cow runs out of milk, you close up shop for the day. Transformation says that we will just place all of our might into creating technological solutions. And while doing so, ourselves, our lives, our environments might be fundamentally transformed into something new. So here's where all of your like typical science fictional themes fall into. So what happens if we do transcend our bodies and we merge with machines? Where does ice cream fit in? Do cyborgs like ice cream? So I think this is, uh, especially for me, it's been a very good way to introduce people to thinking in this kind of way, because believe it or not, you can do this very quickly with a group of people that you bring together around a, an issue or a topic that you have agreed on. And I think that that is something that is very, very necessary and very, very powerful because the future is this flexible thing, as we've discussed, and new ones will emerge every single day. And what that means is that you have a choice. You can choose to work towards bringing to life the kinds of futures that you would be interested in being a part of, that you would prefer to live in. You can influence our futures. And that is a tremendously, tremendously necessary and, and, and powerful and wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take some oh, questions. Okay, sure. We have time for questions, and I have one first. Mm -hmm. We're totally all going to do this now, maybe like tonight. <laughs> yeah. We're going to start thinking about these future scenarios. Should we do research? Like, is it important to actually base some of our projections on like what could transformation mean on some, for instance, science, uh, or is it as fruitful to just like fantasize in a bar? I think it depends on um, what the project is and who the group of people are that you are working with. So sometimes it, it is really revealing when you don't do research and when you bring together uh, people who have these very codified ideas as to, the, yeah, no, 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 this is the, the issue that we're dealing with. And when you extract those raw emotions, so feelings, I don't believe that humans are rational thinkers and that is one of the main things that I work with. It's like. Even though you feel in this incredibly, what some people might call irrational way, that is totally valid and we need to extract that and we need to understand that so that we can move beyond it. We can't pretend like, like you, th your feelings in this way don't count. So it depends on, on who I'm working with and what the project is and sometimes it means that I start off with people just shooting from the gut and sometimes it means that a team of people, like sometimes they do ethnographic research, sometimes it's desk re research, and, and we come together like that, so it depends. But it still means that it's valid to start at a party, for instance, just it in is a group of people. Absolutely That's absolutely right. valid to start, especially with your grandparents, if you have like really different views on things, because they'll start to tell you stuff. Um, an another tool is called the Futures Wheel, which just uh, consequences are really key aspect of thinking about the future. So when you go out like level by level by level based on like one event, okay, if like my ice cream shop goes out of business, what's the first level of consequence? What's the second, what's the third level? And by like the fourth or fifth level, you start to see people like thinking about some really strange and wonderful and gross things. And I think that that is 
super valid to do over Christmas with your family. I also love that b because it actually, it's also a starting point. We've been talking about like you have to see your position in a system. Mm -hmm. And I think some of us have been walking around going very well, but how do I do that? Like that is one really practical way of doing it. Like I do an action, let's look at layers of consequences. Mm. Thank you. Do we have a question from the audience? I know it's late, but you might still have one, and I promise you that we'll be out by six, like we've said. Margaritas. Do we? Yes. Oh, somewhere up high? Yes, in, you're in a dark spot. I'm happy that, that <laughs> the others are pointing and helping. Thank you. We are seeing far from here. Yes. Shoot. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm not sure I understood the citizen rotation office. <laughs> Uh, I'm just wondering, and based on like all either talk, maybe I'm biased or like influenced by all the things we've heard, sure. but it sounds like it's basically manipulating things so that uh, basically you see things through a perspective generated by an algorithm instead of your own perspective. Is that what it is, or no? So what happens? I, I, one of the main parts of it is is that you go through a a citizen assessment. So you have someone that sits down with you and they try to understand aspects of your behavior, your personality, your daily uh, mm -hmm. activities, and then this gets fed into, uh, there are many other bigger pieces to the project that I couldn't expand on, but this gets fed into the algorithm for you to get this kind of rotation schedule. So what the whole uh, scenario was, was that it took a group of people together to go through this uh, kind of citizen assessment and then to place them in this world where they have this rotation schedule based on what this fictional government algorithm would have made for them. And, and all then, choices removed, which at first glance, I think seems quite lovely. And then at the said next breath, quite terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I think like the interesting part, so when you create any kind of project, when you design anything, as we've heard over these couple of days, you start out with your own perspective and your worldviews. So the designer here created a, a fictional world about what happens in this possible future. And, and really the narrative wasn't the most important thing. It was what happens when we start off here. I believe John spoke about it yesterday. It's not about having this like fully fleshed out vision or this goal that you want to achieve, but what happens when we start out here with the basics of this and again, how do we go levels and layers out and what could we understand from that? I don't know. If well. uh, here, down here. It's harder now. <laughs> Everybody who's picking up from daycare has left. Uh, let's wave your hand again so we can see you. Thanks. So yes. you, you talked about many different narratives when it comes to looking at the future. Mm -hmm. And one you didn't mention, I work a lot with like faith-based organizations. And for example, when you look at Nigeria that you were taking as an example, you have a big percentage that are, are Christians, for example. And even within just one faith group, you have many different narratives. And I'm just thinking, how do you see that as influencing kind of how we look at the future, how different cultures look at the future and so on? I think that actually transcends uh, many of them. So I think that, that faith is such uh, an overarching uh, piece of you that goes through everything that, that it is, a, even when you have, uh, for instance, there is, some people think that there isn't um, uh, science fiction based on Islam, but there totally is, but it infuses parts of your, your history and your religion and your faith into this kind of thinking. So I think that it's totally a part of all of these scenarios and especially like if you are working with uh, groups of people where this is the most fundamental thing that you believe, then you start out with that very uh, basic understanding and respect and that is how you build scenarios out from there or, or that is how you watch for certain things that you might think sound a little bit off at first, but if you have people that are very um, open to the process, and if you are very respectful to understand how much their faith means, then you can see why certain decisions are made the way they are and why, why uh, certain paths are chosen. But I think it's, it's something that's just embedded into most of the work, if you're working with that group. And come to think of it, actually, I mean, uh, we, Sweden is so secularized, at least mm -hmm. in the public discourse, that we don't think about this very much, but of mm. course, that whole Western idea of the hero's journey of being tested to be able to transcend somehow mm. is also possibly based 
on the on the sort of omnipresence of Christianity in our history. Mm. So of course it it's also I mean it, there's an illusion to think that there are some kind some kind of rational rational mm. cultures that yeah. would not be shaped by faith that can sure. affect your stories whether you believe it or not. Yeah. And there's an illusion to saying this is the faith box and like how do we deal with that because it just transcends so much. Very good. I have a last very tiny uh, irrelevant question. Okay. But well, for those of us you. who are fascinated now by Caribbean science fiction, where do we begin? <laughs> like do you have a recommendation? Uh, yeah, Tobias Bakel is one of my favorite authors. So is uh, Nalo Hopkinson. She's the woman who wrote something called uh, Midnight Robber, which is where the Granny Nanny story is by. And I think if you start to follow those two authors, it just opens a world of, of things. And also things that, I mean, now they can be qualified as, as science fiction because more and more you know, speculative fiction from, from all of these margins that we haven't really thought about are now saying like, no, this is science fiction, but there's also uh, stuff that wasn't considered that. And like, I think you should start digging, but those are two places that are, that are uh, introductions. But keep in mind, there is some, like some of the, the, the stories are going to be, parts of it are going to be written in like Trinidadian Patois. So if you're not like, don't pick up the book and say, well, I can't, there's no way I could understand this, you, you know, at, I kind of did that in the beginning, even though I'm kind of familiar with it. But stick with it, like we've stuck with, uh, a number of other fictional made-up languages that we've just accepted, we should figure out how to decipher this. Especially since it's an actual language. <laughs> since, it's an, since it's an actual <laughs> more language. More useful. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Dear friends, Angela Ogantala. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you want Thank this? You. Oh, I also want this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>